Hello, my name is Perry Chen. I'm a staff member within the SAMHSA Office of Behavioral Health Equity. On behalf of SAMHSA and OBHE, we would like to welcome and welcome back you for the second section of our data story data storytelling workshop series. I hope many of you find the workshop number one last month helpful. I personally enjoyed it and. Our intention is to make this workshop series practical for community-based organizations. I encourage you to join the organizations to share their great work around data storytelling. I wanted to welcome all of you again, and without further ado, I'll, let me turn back to session number two on data visualization. Um, Health Equity Initiative. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say is that um, if you have questions throughout the workshop, I want you to use the Q&A feature. Live, the recording of resources will be available following the webinar at the uh, net share. Uh, so I'm very excited about this workshop because, as Perry mentioned, we actually have two wonderful organizations actually showcasing their data visualization examples. All right. And so let me actually start by sharing my screen and I'll tell you a little bit more about how we're gonna do this today. All right, share two. All right, you should be able to see my screen right now. You probably are seeing um, from the Annette website, session number two, right? And as you can see, you have all the resources in here as well, okay? All right, so now I am going to actually move us along here. And let me know you should be able to actually be able to see my agenda or the agenda of today workshop, all right? And so, and the way that we're gonna be doing this today is I'm going to go back to uh, and talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we covered on data storytelling 101 on workshop number one. Because as you know, the, and I think the unique thing about all these workshops is that all of them are actually are connected. Now, I just set in the stage for what's coming after, which, as I mentioned, we're having two great organizations um, presenting, um, and they are the actually that that's that's the meat of this workshop because I'm gonna be actually just talking a little bit about the basics of data visualization, but then this uh, community-based organization they're actually gonna take this workshop to the next level. They're gonna be showing some uh, unique examples in how they have chosen to actually present their data. And so 
And you're going to be talking about another 20, 25 minutes each. Uh, you are welcome to ask questions that you actually are listening to their presentation. Again, you can use the Q&A feature to ask questions. And for comments, you actually use the chat box. And um, and if we don't have time towards, you know, to because we need to keep moving, we'll sort of actually then uh, park some of those questions towards the end of the workshop. Now, keep in mind, though, that as you're asking questions, if we don't have time to answer them in real time, in real time here throughout the workshop, we're gonna actually we're creating a QA and a document for, in which we're providing answers to all the questions that actually are coming from you. We wanna make sure that, that this workshop series are as useful and practical as possible. And so we wanna, you know, we wanna thank you for being here. And so also we created a data visualization guide that you can use as you're starting your journey on data storytelling to start thinking about how to actually visualize your data, what kind of visuals you actually can, can actually create. Within that guide, also there are resources that you actually can go and tap into to even enhance your visuals, right? And then we'll have some closer rem remarks uh, uh, and next steps towards the end, and obviously some Q&A too. All right, so let's get started. Um, now, this actually should be uh, very familiar to you if you attended Data Storytelling 101, right? Because we actually talked about this particular um, uh, elements. We actually talked about, when we're talking about the foundation of data storytelling, we're talking about narrative, data, and visual. Those three things need to be actually working together. And so the data storytelling is like telling a story to a friend, but instead of using just words, you also use numbers and pictures to make your point clear. That's the whole purpose of it, right? We wanna make sure that as we are actually telling that story and data is backing that story up, right? It's like, how do we make sure that the audience engages with us and the audience capture what we're saying? And that and data provides the insight to convince the audience to do something about this, right? Or to convey the message. And so when all these three elements come together in perfect balance, they help bring about change in the form of perception, education, engagement, behavior change. If you actually are trying to get buy-in for your program, for, for, for processes within the organization, obviously using these elements will help you convey that message, right? So when we talked about data visualization, like if you do a Google search, you're gonna find a lot of definitions. So there's a lot of definitions, you know, you might find that it's in, in, in some of your results, um, your search results that it is the process of presenting data in a visual format to make it easier to understand and analyze, right? Here's another one. It's also the process of using visual elements like charts, graphs, videos to represent data. Okay, yeah, you're actually just creating visuals that actually that people are able to see and they're able to understand the data by the visuals that they actually are seeing. Now, for more complex data, it can help you translate that complex high volume or numerical data into a visual representation that is easier to process. And that's what we're doing. When we're talking about visualization, think about this. We wanna make sure that the audience understand our narrative. We have the data that provides the insights, is backing up our story, right? But we wanna make sure that they actually get to see it and understand it, right? And that's, that's why data visualization is so important. Now. What is, what is actually data visualization also improves and automate the visual communication process for accuracy and detail. So your visualization can actually help you capture that detail that might not necessarily be part of your narrative, right? But is actually represented in the visual of your data. 
Right? And we'll talk more about this in detail as we go along. So in simple terms, it's telling a story with data using visuals. That's what, it, that's what that is, right? Now, let me show you an example here. You do a, a lot of explanation just to make sure that you understand what actually this visual is telling you, right? Because it's a whole bunch of text. Obviously, it's not the best way for us to actually show a visual of a particular set of data, right? So there's another way that we actually can do this, right? If I actually grab the same information and put it in here, all of a sudden, actually, my eyes go to the blue and green, right? And I can see that one is, is actually larger than the other. Here, I cannot see that pattern. Here, I can. And so that's the importance of data visualization. Now, if I actually go, and you remember this particular diagram, this particular actually um, graphic here, and these are the elements of data storytelling, remember? So we talked about, oh yes, we gotta have a clear objective. What's the purpose of the story? right? What is it that we want to do? Do we want to inform, persuade, inspire? Um, what is, what's very important role in conveying data in a digestible and visually appealing manner. That's what we actually, that's what we're aiming for. So choosing the right charts, graph, infographics, video, um, that best represent your data and make it easier for your audience to grasp the information that is key. So for example, you can use a bar chart if you are showcasing the number of individuals seeking help for mental health monthly or comparing service usage rates across different age groups within a community within a community right so that is actually what we're going to be concentrated on today is element number 3 element number 4 we're talking about engaging narrative and the contextual interpretation we actually talked quite a bit about those two elements on the workshop number 1 and you have a whole guide uh, in regards to that with a specific examples in how to create a powerful narrative. But for this particular workshop, we're gonna be actually just focusing on data visualization, right?
but I wanted to actually bring you back a little bit to for you to sort of remember what are the different elements, right? In, in the order that actually they go into. So. best way for me to actually visualize it, present that visual so they can actually engage with me and understand my story and the data that I'm presenting, right? So based on that, you know, this actually, the, this data visualization design process is divided into four steps. The number one is choosing the right visualization type. And this one is the one that I'm going to be focusing right now for the next uh, few minutes here, right? And so when we're talking about choosing the right visualization type, we're talking about what is it, what's it, what's what actually, what is the type of visualization that actually best supports my message and makes my data easily interpretable, right? So in this case, we need to choose clear and straightforward visualization, such as, in, and we're talking about bar charts, light graph, pie charts, depending on whether you want to show comparison, trends, or distributions. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar in terms of how to use all of these, the, all those different types of visualizations, no worries. The guide that I created for you, it's actually walk you step by step and it gives you a specific examples on how to use them, right? We're gonna cover some of those here, but I want you to, I wanna make sure that I wanna highlight the importance of that guide because you also have a case study in how do you apply that guy into a specific case study of an organization that actually need to create some, um, some visuals for the data they're actually working with, all right? So number one, number two, obviously, we wanna make sure that the data is, 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 is uh, we wanna get rid of unnecessary numbers, unnecessary data. We wanna focus on what is relevant. We wanna make sure that it's presenting data that directly support the message, the goal, the objective. Remember, that was actually the first um, element of a data storytelling. So we wanna make sure that we understand that. We wanna make sure that we take that into account. So in other words, we gotta get rid of details that are not necessary and use annotations to guide the audience's attention to the most crucial parts of the data. The guy has a specific examples in regards to that as well. Understand who your audience is. Are they familiar with, with, um, with data? Are they familiar with the topic that you actually are talking about? Will they actually engage and understand that data visualization type that you have chosen, right? And you got to think about those with disabilities. Um, and you want to make sure that you actually then create a design that takes that into account as well. And so, uh, so in other words, uh, you can think about colors, for example. You can use color contracts effectively for readability. You can actually include alt text descriptions for digital visuals and consider interactive elements for online engagement. And you're going to actually see examples of that as well, too, through one of the uh, uh, examples of the uh, CBO that we actually have here for you. So, and then we actually, you know, number four is test gathering feedback. And this is basically, you create your, your, your uh, visualization example, and you want to make sure that you actually showcase it to your audience, to your colleagues, for people to actually give you feedback and yet in how you can enhance it and make it better. This is key though, because while we might think it might work for our audience without getting additional feedback, uh, we might be disappointed actually when we show the final design without actually gathering initial feedback that that might not be necessarily the right type of visualization. So this is important as we're The impact and any improvement needed, it is key, all right? So these are the four elements right here. Now, if we talk about element number one, choosing the right visualization type, I'm going to go uh, and, and describe, you know, the different types of uh, visualization that you might consider, right? 
But before I do that, let me actually see here if I have any comments, questions so far in regards to what we covered. I want to make sure that I'm actually paying attention. You're engaging with me. Uh, anything that I need to make sure that I am paying attention to you. All right. Okay, so let's actually continue here because I need to give enough time to our wonderful organizations that are gonna actually be showcasing their examples. So let's actually start with this. So we're talking about the bar charts here and actually let me move some things around here. So Mike, I wanna make sure that I get rid of this. All right. So in this case, for example, we're talking about bar charts. These actually are good when you wanna compare quantities between different categories, right? In this example, for, for example, you, you see that the service utilization by type represent the number of individuals using various mental health services, revealing the most and least popular services. So you can actually tell a story here just by looking at these numbers, right? We want to keep it simple. We want to be, you want to make sure that it's easy to understand. In this case, what is it that we want to showcase? We want to actually showcase, okay, how many people are actually accessing the different services that we offer? So in this case, we actually have people about, you know, 150 actually are receiving counseling. Then we have about 100. when it comes to families that I think the community is also struggling with, but we only have about 75 of them actually coming to family support. Is this correct? Does this actually tell us the story of the community based on the work that we're doing, right? So there's so many things that you can actually do when you start visualizing your data, right? So if we talk about num you know, line graphs, for example, as another visualization type, this one over here is best when you actually want to display data trends over time, right? In this example, the help requests over time demonstrate changes in the number of requests for assistance over several months, showing trend patterns. So if we're looking at the patterns here, there's a lot of things that we actually can, we might want to assume, right? For example, if we notice that in January, we actually had, you know, in terms of help requests, it was around 40, but then all of a sudden by June, it's actually going over 80. Okay, what's causing that, right? Are we doing a, are we doing a better job in outreach? Then now all of a sudden people actually are aware of the services that we provide. And therefore, obviously they actually are requesting help, right? What actually have caused for that to increase when we start seeing the patterns, right? It is something happening in April versus May, for example. So there's a Let's actually go and talk a little bit about pie charts now as another visualization type, right? This one is actually when you wanna show proportions that make up a whole. In this case, we actually talk, show, uh, you know, talking about the demographic serve proportion that shows the portion of different demographics served by a program, highlighting representation and outreach diversity. So in other words, when you look at the numbers here, we see that 40% of the, uh, the demographic that we serve are youth. They follow by 35% adults and 25% seniors. So we look at the diversity of the uh, audience that we are serving, right? But also, again, it allows us to think a little bit more in terms of why is it that we have a 40% and only 25%, 40% uh, of our youth and all.
based on the programs that you have as an, as an organization, and you know that it's youth, adults, and seniors are the ones who are supposed to actually get these services, that's great. The question is, is 25% a good number of do we need to increase that, right? Same with adults, right? And so those are some of the things that you start thinking about when you start visualizing that data. And this is some of the stories that you actually get to tell to your audience as well. All right, let's go to the next one. We got a couple more before actually I bring these wonderful organizations. But actually the purpose of doing this is to sort of actually just giving you a sort of data visualization 101, right? To actually present to you how you might wanna think about, you know, visualizing or showcasing your data. So in this, in this example, for, for example, we are using a scatter plots, right? And so this one is best when you are investigating or showing the relationship between two variables, right? So in this case, if we look at this one, the outreach extent and help requests received illustrates the correlation between the extent of outreach efforts and the number of help requests received, potentially identified effective outreach strategies. So this is actually somewhat similar to the ones that we actually talked about when we look at that. I think the first one was a bar chart. But if you look at here though, you look at the help requests, which actually are the plots here, the X that you actually can see here, right? And then you have a trend line. Consider adding a trend line to highlight correlations more clearly. That's the tip, right? And so basically, as you can see, you can see how this, this help requests actually have increased as we continue moving, right? And so basically it tells you, all right, great. So that means that if we are conducting outreach efforts, they are working because we are getting more uh, requests for help. And this is another way of us sort of actually showcasing that, whether we are showcasing that to the staff, we're showcasing that to, uh, to the board. Uh, this is a great example in order for us to actually make a point. And the point is, look, we have conducted some outreach efforts here and notice how based on that, we are getting actually help requests, meaning that the message is conveying with the audience is getting through the audience. They actually are aware of the services that we provide and they're calling us to take advantage of those services. Again, this is part of the narrative that you might want to add to this particular example, right? All right, and finally, we're talking about histograms. Now, this is a little bit different and I'm gonna give you an example uh, in terms of what a histogram is, but it's, it's a type of chart that actually helps us understand how data is spread out. So, and the best way for me actually to show you this is by actually showing you this example, rather than actually just going and reading that, let me actually just show you this. So in this case, we're looking at the distribution of a data set, right? So you can see that a histogram is visualizing the age distribution of program participants for behavioral health community-based organizations. And this is actually, you can see it here, right? So this type of chart is particularly effective in showing the distribu distribution of a single numerical var variable. In this case, the age different ages in here. Uh, the Y axis here show the number of participants in each uh, age range and the bar. Each bar stands for an age range. The height of the bar indicates how many participants are in that age range. So from what we can see here, we can see that the tallest bar is at the 30, 40, 30, 40 age range meaning most participants are in their 30s, right? Now, the number of participants decreases as the age decreases. You can see that, right? And so, and so as the age increases, the number of participants decreases. I'm sorry. So after 40, we can see how the number of participants actually are coming down, right? So there are very few participants in the youngest, older than 20, and the oldest over 80, right? So this histogram helps us understand which age groups are most and least represented in the behavioral health program. It seems that middle-aged adults are the primary users of the program with fewer young adults, adolescents, and seniors participating. So this is another way of showing though, if you actually are 
you know, providing the services to the right audience, to the right demographics. And so when you want to actually show uh, the distribution in this case of a data set, in this case, we're actually talking about the ages of, of the participant. This is another way of actually showcasing it. All right. So I'm going to stop right there. Any comments, questions, concerns? All right. So I wanted to set the stage in terms of um, uh, level when it comes to data storytelling. So what we wanted to make sure is that as we are doing this workshop series, provide a very good foundation and walk you through to the different levels. In this case, my job is to sort of actually walk you through that. Now, on the guide that I created, you have more specific examples, um, as well as the, as the case study that I created, it tells you how to apply it, right? But now, what you are about to see, we're gonna have two organizations now telling you how they created the data visualization, what actually the story behind it, and it's actually a little bit different than what you actually have seen so far. So they've taken this workshop to the next level. So uh, I'm gonna start now. So please welcome, oh man, I, I wish we had like some drum rolls or something. Um, you know, we're gonna start with Dana. And Dana actually is, um, it's gonna be actually showcased from the Virginia Community Voice, Dana Kiernan. I, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right, Dana. If not, I apologize. And we're going to start with her, and she's going to be the one actually talking about, she's going to be starting with talking about her data visualization type. She's going to tell her story, um, and then feel free to ask questions as you actually are listening to her. Um, and then we'll move into uh, the next data visualization example number two. But for right now, let's, let's give the floor to Dana. So I... Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dana Kiernan. The pronunciation was perfect, it's totally fine. Um, <laughs> and I am from Virginia Community Voice. It is a community engagement and organizing nonprofit based in Richmond, Virginia. And right now we're working in the South side of Richmond. Uh, and our mission is to equip neighbors in historically marginalized communities to realize their vision for their neighborhoods and to also prepare institutions to respond effectively. Um, and our vision, it's a big vision, it's a lofty goal, it's for uh, equitable decision-making throughout the state of Virginia. And so we really do this um, through our unique model of community engagement and it's a four-stage process. And then we go through listen, connect, craft, and reflect. And the Involved in this data sweet spot is lived experience, quantitative data, and the context of history and policy within the region that you're working in. And so I'll briefly give some examples here. So um, for history, we recommend going back at least 50 years when you're looking into a community, because we know that policies and the effects of today, they didn't happen overnight. Um, it wasn't just, you know, one decision that creates communities and the challenges within communities um, overnight, right? It wasn't a decision last month. It wasn't a decision last year. Policies going back all the way 50 years plus really set communities up for success or failure. And so the community that I'm going to be talking about, again, is the south side of Richmond. And just a little bit about it, it's... Um, mostly black and Hispanic and white, but it wasn't always that way. Um, 
it was in the uh, it started off white and then it eventually over time changed into a black community. And so when we look at the history of that, there's a couple reasons potentially why. And so some of that was redlining, some of that was freeway constructions through black neighborhoods, some of it is the legacy of That's our next slide, but we won't get into that just yet. Um, and we also use quantitative data, and that is disaggregated data, usually by census tract. And we like to use disaggregated data, which just means like broken out into smaller pieces, because oftentimes when you have lumps of data, things get lost in there. And so if you wanted to be really specific about the neighborhood that you're in, it's really important to look at that, for instance, by census tract, instead of looking at, for example, metropolitan statistical area, or the MSA, because that encompasses a lot and you're going to miss some of the differences and the disparities that you'll see um, by just breaking it down into looking at, again, the census tract or by race or by age or by disability status, et cetera. And we also look at population, economic, public health and education data. And so another piece of the story that I'm going to be telling a little bit about today right now is when we look at the south side of Richmond, if we looked at just the quantitative data, we would have come in to see education was, educational attainment was really not the same as the rest of Richmond. And so as a nonprofit, when we first moved into this neighborhood or came into the neighborhood, if we had just stopped there, looking at the Um, interest in the organization that we are lucky to have now, right? But we really wanted to center communities' voices and so in the community's vision and their goals. And so that's where we really brought in the lived experience. And we went to communities, went to civic associations, to different areas um, where neighbors were gathering, and we asked, what would it look like and take for your community to thrive? And what we heard wasn't anything about education. And that's not to say it wasn't important or isn't important for that community for their youth to be well educated or to have the same opportunities through education. It just wasn't top of mind for them. But what they did share was, you know, we want a beautiful and clean neighborhood. So neighborhood pride. We want um, a neighborhood where we can continue to live here because housing is getting more expensive. And oh, what was the other one? Oh, we want a safe neighborhood because uh, when we walk down the street, we're afraid that the cars are going too fast and we wanted to be able to have a walkable and pedestrian friendly neighborhood. And so what we also found is that these are very much indicators of education. And so once we are able to get that complete picture, we're able to also then work with communities to address those issues, which then also end up addressing other issues. And so for me, I guess a little bit of um, advice if this is something that folks haven't thought about or heard before is when you're asking communities what they want and what We saw, like I said before, was moving into the Southside neighborhood, we saw that at one point it was all white, and then it turned through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond to be mostly all Black. And so we could have um, stopped there with population data, for example, to say, oh, well, that 
that's an interesting trend and then nothing comes of it. Um, or we could maybe have guessed that it was white flight and blockbusting or that redlining has something to do with it. But we really wanted to understand what the experiences of our neighbors are, what they were. And so this video is an interview with one of our steering committee members for our organization, um, Ms. McQueen, and she shares about her experience living and growing up in the South Side in the 70s. When I first moved here in 1970, this neighborhood was virtually all white. Would send letters, the same as they're doing today, to us to tell us that they want to. Blacks were moving into the neighborhood and therefore the value of the properties were going to go down. And that caused a lot of families to decide that they didn't want to stay, that they were going to move out and move somewhere else. And so gradually the neighborhood became virtually all black. Thank you. And then if we can just show our last slide so that way. Okay. Okay. So again, what really our data philosophy and our data sweet spot means for us is that we're able to center the community's priorities. Uh, we're able to have that really complete picture of a community. We're able to build trust and authentic relationships with folks. And the engagement with Virginia Community Voice is strong. In South Richmond, and then we created a steering committee of neighbors to decide which topics that they wanted to address first. And then from that, we ended up addressing neighborhood beautification and housing, safety, and then jobs access. Um, and then also, along with some of these um, things about housing, I know that Ms. McQueen, if you caught it in the beginning, said just like they're doing now, Realtors are coming in, knocking on our door, wanting to buy our homes today, and then also it happened in the past. And so um, today they're coming in to try and flip homes. And so gentrification has become one of the major issues that Virginia Community Voice is working on. But we also maybe would not have gotten that context or understood what neighbors are going through now without really understanding the lived experience of our neighbors. And so because we're taking the time to listen and center their voices, center what they want to do, letting them decide where the organization is going to put our resources behind, um, we've able we've been able to keep folks engaged in the long term and also make the lasting change that neighbors are hoping to see. And it really is based upon the foundation of the sweet spot for us. And and Dana, if, if I may, I think one yes. of the things that I love about your example, the data sweet spot concept, which I think is it's is very important, right? Because you're talking about the data that probably already exists. You're looking at the it numbers, you, you're looking at the gaps, the needs are there in the community. But just looking at the data alone is not enough. If you want to actually work in the community, if you want to build something in the community that is going to benefit the whole community, you have to look at the other two factors, in which I love. Actually, you got to look at the context of history and policy, because you have to understand what has happened in the history. their voices are not being heard. So based on that, how do you actually establish trust with the community 
in order for them to engage with you and sort of actually be part of the story, tell you about their, 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 their experiences, actually be willing to be part of committees, be making decisions. So how do you build that trust? I'm so glad that you asked that. Okay, because also that's part of our uh, cycle of community engagement. So listening and connecting with neighbors. Uh, so the first thing that we really recommend that you do is you listen, right? And you listen authentically. A lot of times communities, um, community members, especially in uh, communities that have been systematic, systemically and systematically deprived of resources, their voices haven't been heard. And so they might've been speaking but they've been ignored. So really listening authentically um, is, I would say, the first step. But in order to be able to find folks um, that want to engage with you, you have to go to where the people are, right? And so you have to go to the communities that you want to engage with. And another important factor is um, hiring people from the communities that you are actually going into. So for example, the South Richmond community, like I said, is mostly black. It's also upcoming Hispanic. There's growing number and then the rest of it is white. And so, um, for example, I'm probably not the best person to go in to do the direct community engagement. And I can come in later perhaps after relationships have already been addressed or already um, been established, but like it, me is not the person to go in there. And so, Hiring folks from the community, hiring them at um, a livable wage is really important. And then teaching them how to create authentic relationships. But they also already have them, right? So they know their neighbors. They go to church there. Um, and they have those connections. And so building trust starts with finding those people who are have similar views to you. We use an organizing technique called a one-to-one, -one, where it's not exactly an interview it is, but it's a sort of a guided question with uh, question series with the intent of continued relationship building at the end of it. So you don't just do one one-to-one -one and move on to the next person. You always go back to that person to do one-to-ones. And then you follow through. When you make a promise to a community, you follow through with that promise. And so all of these different elements together um, start to build trust with and amongst community members and your organization. Because organizations have a lot of power in communities. Um, yeah. You come in with resources, you come in. Just, uh, you know, tell you what are some of the comments here that we'll be getting, oh, yeah. um, you know, so Thank we you. said, you know, from Susan, she said, yes, representation or you, on your team is critical. And you made that point. If you actually are working with a community that is actually mostly black, obviously you got to think about how do we establish that show? How we actually start establish that relationship, right? But here's the other thing too, you are hiring from the community. You are actually also developing skill sets as well. They are, and see, you already mentioned this, they already have that relationship, right? So it's 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 very important to also have, like this, uh, like Susan said, representation or your team of the audience that you're working with. It gives you credibility, right? And so, mm -hmm. and here's the other thing too. If you look at the context of history and policy, you have to have representation on your team from the community you're working with, right? It's Very common true. sense, you right? You do. And so so it's 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 important. So I wanted to actually tell you that uh, from Julie says, D Dana, uh, we appreciate your authenticity, authenticity, authenticity. So that's awesome. Uh, we have from Joanne, she says, spot on. So grateful to hear this. So uh, from, I don't know if I'm pron pronouncing this name right, but it says uh, to pull. Um, yes, community researchers appreciate how intentional your approach, uh, your approach, Dana. Uh, thank you for your work. Florencia says, yes. Anya, yes. It makes it more approachable, relatable, and trusting. Uh, from Fl Florencia again, thank you for speaking truth and teaching us how to be better advocates. Whoa. So you got some awesome comments in here, Dana, based, based on your presentation. So this is, this is thank great. You. Um, 
Now, uh, in terms of actually establishing that trust now, are there lessons learned? Were, they, were there challenges, even though you have teams, you're representing the, you know, within your team, within your staff, you are, um, you know, you have community members, they already have the relationship, they're going into the community, right? But are, are there any lessons learned, any challenges that you actually enc encounter along the way? Yes, I'm so glad that you asked that because I want to talk about that next. So we have a really strong Black staff. They're great. They've worked with the community for a long time, but we knew that that's not the only population that is on the south side of Richmond. We also know that there's the growing Hispanic population. And so we tried really hard within our first community survey to engage the Hispanic community. And they make up about 10% of the population, according to the census. We know that that is often undercounted for this community. Um, and we only got a 4% response rate from that community. And we knew that um, that wasn't on that community, which is oftentimes where organizations stop. They say, well, we tried to engage them. We hired a Spanish speaking person to go into the community. We we tried our best, they weren't interested. Um, but that's actually oftentimes not the case, right? We just weren't doing all the things that we could have been doing as an organization to reach that community. And so, we saw that as a gap, we saw that as a failure, but we also believe in failing forward. And so we thought, okay, we need to make a change. And so we ended up hiring three uh, Latina staff members. And so in our next round of community surveys, who were also very connected with the community. So one was working for RPS, another had been in the, oh, sorry, excuse me, the Richmond Public School System. Um, and another one um, had been in the community for a long time. And then a third had, uh, come in to help us. And so we were able to reassess and revamp our um, tactics on how to reach the Hispanic community and what to do and how to do it appropriately and culturally competently. And so in our next round of surveys, we were able to get like an 8% response rate, which was so, what was it, 16? I don't remember. It was a much higher response rate, but yeah, we really did not do well the first time. So that was a challenge. And we really had to pivot the way we thought about engaging a different community than what we were used to. Um, and then we also oftentimes have to check our assumptions. I forgot to mention that earlier, but I think this is also a good time to mention that is we, when we were doing our initial survey, we got back that safety was a really big issue for this community. And all of us sort of, assumed it was violence and gun safety that was, or gun violence or violence in general, that was making people feel unsafe in their communities. Uh, but when we dug a little bit deeper and we asked people in one-to-ones in interviews, like, oh, we heard a lot about safety. Like, can you tell us a little bit more about like what makes you feel unsafe? It actually turned out to be pedestrian safety. We were off, we were way off. Uh, people yeah. were, cars were driving too fast. Um, people wanted to be able to bike, they couldn't bike, there's no bike lanes. And so we were uh, we were wrong. We were accepted that we were wrong. And we were able to, again, before we got too far along thinking about violence or gun safety, pivot to um, doing a program that reduced um, speeding through specific intersections where there had been some, some accidents and people were feeling unsafe. Well, yes. And so it, it's, it's interesting how we tend to have lots of assumptions, right? And mm -hmm. so, uh, but once we start getting to know the community, obviously uh, we start learning quite a bit. Um, and what happened is we can have all the data in the world, uh, but without that context of history and that live experience, that data, they're just numbers because we are not necessarily providing what the community need. And so that's why I love your example, because it's a unique way of sort of actually applying this concept. But at the same time, I love the video in which you actually are, have one community member actually telling her story, but she's talking about the context of history and what has happened in the last 50 years or so, and actually her lived experience too. And so it is powerful and is another great way of actually telling this story. So. Dana, I wanted to actually, um, you know, uh, because it's, it, it's, I mean, you're getting a lot of great comments here, uh, you know, from Caitlin, so grateful to know folks like you are doing this good work. 
Power sharing is super important. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience. Uh, community trust is apex. Uh, I like the live experience, interviews and incorporating quality info. Much of data in my background has been, you know, quant focused, but this info is crucial to incorporate. Um, failing forward from Enya and not giving up. Love it. Yes. Thank you for sharing. So I wanted to actually just share those comments with you. Um, we want to thank you for your time and investing in actually telling us you're showcasing your example. Um, and so again, we really, really, really appreciate it, Dana. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for having me, for letting me represent Trinity Community Voice. And y'all, I'll put my contact information in the chat if y'all have questions um, or wanna reach out about stuff. So thank you so, so much for having me. I really appreciated sharing. All right, all right. All right. So what do you guys think about this? I promise you, I told you that we were actually having two wonderful organizations to actually showcase in their examples and telling a little bit about their story. This concept of the data sweet spot is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really unique. And I love the way that actually they work with the community. And so, um, so having said that, we're going to go into example number two. And this actually is uh, coming from Meredith Gibson from the Institute for Public Strategies. And so uh, I am going to uh, welcome Meredith to actually start Hi. here. Great. Hey. Um, well, thank you, uh, Carlos and uh, his team for um, having me here to talk about uh, my project that I use. And uh, Dana, big, big shout out to you. I love, love that concept of the sweet spot. And um, in kind of in my field, we um, we look at that, but also the, um, you know, especially the history of, and policy context. Um, one of the things that we have um, really started looking at more closely at is the redlining data. And I was happy to see that in your presentation um, because it is a historical policy that whose legacy continues to impact health equity today. Um, and it seems like there is uh, just more and more research that has been coming out on how um, neighborhoods that were historically redlined, they are suffering um, disproportionately from health, um, you know, from health inequities. So it's very, that is such a very important uh, component also of what I do. And so just to... Um, Introduce myself. So I'm Meredith Gibson, and I'm the Media and GIS Director at the Institute for Public Strategies. We are a public health uh, nonprofit organization based in Southern California. We've got projects in San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Bernardino counties, um, but we've done work all over the country as well as abroad. And we um, partner with communities uh, to give them tools to build power and elevate their voices um, so that collectively uh, we can promote health and well-being and kind of create those types of neighborhoods where everyone wants to wants to live or work in. And, um, and because we know that not everyone has the same resources um, or advantages to bring about that positive well-being, we also look at those inequities that hold some of these communities back from reaching their full potential. And the, the purpose of the tool that I'm going to be presenting is to visualize how health disparities in the communities of color specifically are created when substance use and the social determinants of health intersect. And I'll get a little bit more into that in a sec, but um, specifically where there is high alcohol density and low measures of the social determinants of health. And these, um, they're maps. And so they can be used to galvanize the community to advocate for policies that improve health and safety. And so one of the ways, um, I guess kind of like our shining example of um, how um, we've uplifted or have supported communities comes from Casa de Oro, which is a community in East San Diego County. It's an unincorporated part of the county. And back in 2015, there were a couple of teenagers uh, from the local high school walking down the street and they kept passing these illegal dispensaries. At the time, cannabis or recreational cannabis was illegal. Nevertheless, the dispensaries um, 
kept popping up due to lack of political will or law enforcement and quashing them. And then, you know, and they were passing by a ton of liquor stores and they were saying, you know, to themselves that about La Jolla students don't have to walk past this many cannabis dispensaries or liquor stores. And if um, you don't know anything about San Diego County, La Jolla is a very sort of rich, um, high income area in the county. And so they um, did an environmental scan. And so they literally like had like a piece of paper and they went and they collected data and they looked at, they counted like the number of liquor stores. And they also looked at the uh, liquor stores that were out of compliance. And what they found was that there were 19 liquor stores, but the California Alcoholic Beverage Control only technically authorized three liquor stores to be in that census tract. And of the 19 um, liquor stores that were there, 100% of them were out of compliance with the uh, ABC regulations. And so they took, the these high school students took this data and they took it to the community. And it and from there, the, the ball started rolling. And so fast forward to 2024, they, uh, Casa de Oro um, has cleaned up quite a bit. They now have a specific plan that has been approved by the County of San Diego. They have, there's more enforcement on these illegal cannabis dispensaries. It used to be that, you know, they shut down one cannabis dispensary and another one would pop up. It was like whack-a-mole. And, um, but not to say that, that uh, illegal dispensaries aren't still a problem, but much less so than they were in 2015. And then they've also done some more local um, policies or some more ordinances that bring new licenses as well as those that have been grandfathered in under compliance um, so that they have to conform to certain policies that um, are in stay in tune with the nature of the neighborhood. But I mentioned that environmental scan because that is one data collection um, that is part of GIS. And if you could um, advance to the next slide. So before I get any further, uh, let me just quickly define uh, geographic information systems or GIS for those who may not be familiar with it. But it is a system for collecting, managing, analyzing, and visualizing data. Um, logistics. Um, it's it's everywhere. And public health, I always jokingly say this, is that public health is kind of one of the last frontiers when it comes to like new technology. But, um, but GIS has been, people have been using GIS and very, very much so to uncover, like looking at how location is re or is related to health. So again, going back to the redlining example, they found in San Diego County, that neighborhoods that had been redlined had, uh, uh, again, disproportionate number of liquor stores to this day. So again, applying and then we look at like what the, um, say for instance, the crime or the DUI crashes or the health impacts are in those um, formerly redlined areas. And what we notice is that there are some disparities in terms of not only income, but also health disparities. And what we have done is we've shared these maps and uh, conducted these spatial analyses, and we shared them with community members and uh, policymakers, such as like city council or board of supervisor, and also the media. And one of my the other hat I wear at IPS is again as the media director, and so we will have um, media events. And we have to, or press conferences, if you will, and we'll have visual set up. And the last press conference we had, we had a number of visuals. And the one that they all zoned in on was a map that was created to demonstrate alcohol density or that um, where there is a
the best examples I, I have of this is before I got into Arizona and um, it can be uh, the instant They, we had maps for several different audiences. So depending on you know who it was, whether it was like for an evacuation route or whether it was for how they had to um, uh, build a, a fire line, it told a story. It told the fire. There you go. Okay, so you can click once. Actually, go ahead and click two more times. There you go. Okay, so I mentioned the social determinants of health before. Some of you may be familiar with this infographic right here, but these are the conditions in the environment that affect our health and even our life expectancy. So yeah, we can count things like, you know, access to um to parks, for instance, or access to healthy nutritional choices as being part of the social determinants of health is not just about, um, you know, how much exercise you you get or how or your, you know, like if you have to take certain medications or something. So these are things that are outside in our environment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, we've got the um, so the education access, uh, educational um, opportunities, uh, economic impact, the neighborhood built environment, social context, and then also access to health care. And then you combine those with the location. And so, for instance, it could be a census block. It could be a census tract. It could be a watershed, zip code, a municipality, a school district, a county or a state and so forth. And you combine those things who uh, to you layer those things to form a pattern or a relationship to see where they exist. And it underscores the premise that place matters, that where we are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age all influence our quality of life and even our life expectancy. And uh, next slide, please. Next slide. There you go. Okay. So just diving a little bit more into the social determinants of health, because this is um, what I built my index on. Um, if you, healthcare access and quality. So better access is indicated by regular source of care, frequent use of primary care. This was associated with reduced odds of heavy drinking. Click one more time. I should have just had these all at once instead of clicking. I apologize, this is from a previous presentation. Um, the social and community context. Individuals who have higher levels of social support and community cohesion generally are thought to be healthier because they have better links to basic health information, better access to health services, and greater financial support with medical costs. Um, neighborhood built environment. Again, the neighborhood environment shapes alcohol use disorder. Um, and there's lots of research that is done on alcohol density. And then economic stability. A study from the U.S. revealed that job loss was associated with higher risk of alcohol-related health problems and the development of alcohol addiction. The data, however, was inconsistent and in whether we we're talking short-term loss, such as, um, or if I wanted to mention about the social and community context. You can also um, 
a look at crime. When crime becomes a factor of neighborhood disorganization, uh, along with drug selling and graffiti, it creates that broken window effect and social cohesion starts to break down. Now, next slide, please. <laughs> And next one, there you go, okay. So I wanted to look at areas in San Diego County um, that were most vulnerable to alcohol-related harms. So again, looking, thinking about DUI crashes, increased violence, crime, sexual assaults, domestic violence, things like that. So I created this alcohol vulnerability index. And these are the factors. So in the first column, I have the social determinants of health indicator, all the ones that I just mentioned. And then from the American Community Survey, would influence uh, how it's influenced by that. And then my rationale um, that I just went through. And so I wanted to, you know, use that, combine it with alcohol density and alcohol density being the metric defined as the average distance of a person to their nearest uh, liquor store, uh, off sale alcohol retailer. And so I combine those into one to understand more about social determinants of health. I realized that um, it wasn't enough just to, you know, have that one calculation. And so it was a, it, alcohol harm prevention. It's a very Mm, it's a, it's a complex problem um, that involves very, you know, intricate solutions. And so this, by doing it this way, I've tried to capture as much as I could in this iteration, I'll talk a little bit more about what's planned ahead, um, that does speak to the social department, uh, de determinants of health. In this particular index, I did not include race or ethnicity into the index um, because it was important to <laughs> focus on what people experience rather than who they are. But I will demonstrate a visualization um, in this presentation that does take into account race and ethnicity. Um, let's see, next slide, please. Okay, so actually, Carlos, if you don't mind, um, I'd like to share my screen. Yep, I'll stop sharing right now. Okay. Okay, can you see my map up on your screen? Yes. Great, okay. So this, welcome to San Diego County right here. Um, this is a map of the uh, Alcohol Vulnerability Index or AVI. And I'm gonna open up my legend here. And I'm, where it says high and high. So I've, um, this, this is called a bivariate choropleth map. I don't want you to feel intimidated. It sounds a lot smarter than it really is. It's basically, two variables that have been mapped combined to create one color, <laughs> excuse me. So in this diamond here that I'm looking at, I am mostly concerned with the extremes, okay? So I'm looking where it says high, high, and that means high AVI percentile and high percent non-white. I'm also interested in comparing that to the regions that are shaded beige here, low AVI percentile, low non-white. Down here in south in the south part of the county, this is the South Bay um, region and border region. We've got Tijuana right there over the border. This is a um, heavily concentrated Latino population here. I, because of what I know about uh, having lived in that region for a long time, I do know that West Tula Vista here, this side right here, these brown census tracts, I'm not surprised to find that it has a very high ABI percentile, high score. Um, the higher the score, the uh, more vulnerable it is to uh, alcohol-related harms. I'm not surprised to see that it has a very high ABI score and a very high uh, concentration of 
percentage of non-white population. I'm gonna compare that now to the areas that are shaded with the sort of this um, off-white beige color, okay? These are, again, census tracts. These represent areas that have a low alcohol vulnerability index score and a low percentage of non-white population. So basically it's majority white. Again, not, not surprised by this. Around here is La Jolla that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, over here is around where uh, Casa de Oro is. I'm not at all surprised by this. And the reason that we use this to uh, kind of compare and contrast, like why is it in San Diego? What policies do we have going on in either all of San Diego County or um, in the, their 18 municipalities in the county that is creating such a, dis a disparity? So again, like we use these types of maps to inform policymakers. Um, and kind of stir up a little bit of competition, you know, if you will, like, uh, you know, no one wants to be the representative on the Board of Supervisor whose region is called out because it has, you know, poor health outcomes, for instance. Um, so using a percentile is a very useful way of demonstrating to these policymakers and community members what's going on. So for instance, if I click on this census tract, Um, so that's high. The highest you can get is a 730, but what's more important is the ABI percentile. So in this census tract, 97.1% of the other census tracts in San Diego County is less vulnerable, excuse me, is more vulnerable to alcohol-related harms. Conversely, 2.9%, only 2.9% are less vulnerable. So this, because it's got such a high percentile, that high number, it's it's in bad, it's in bad shape when it comes to alcohol-related harms and vulnerability. Um there are other uh, types of analyses that you can include. Um I won't go into those, but it's, but just, or explain it, but um, this is an 80, sorry, that's not the one I want. Um, this is a crime optimized hotspot analysis. So you'll see that where these dark red, um, oh, can you see that? I'm not sure if you can see. I'm, yes. I get so, okay, great. So this is like where there are um, a lot of uh, concentrated hotspots of crime. And you can uh, use it as a layer. So yep. you can see how it's going. You know, you can see that those hotspots are happening around, not surprisingly, where these brown areas are and as well down here. Um, so GIS also allows you, again, like for that layering of, uh, of information so that you can look at relationships. Great. And so we have a few more minutes. And so here's actually what I want to make sure that we do here. I want to actually, there are people actually asking questions. They have comments about your presentation. And I want to make sure that I actually, I, I, I do this. We have about 10 minutes left. So I want to take advantage of that time. Um, and so, you know, from Rosemary in the comment section, she said that social det uh, determinants of health slide with associated negative outcome is very informative. From Venice, she said that this is the best social determinants of health slide I've seen to date. Um, uh, from Matthew, it says in using maps, are different. Um, here's a question for you, Meredith. How has the changing landscape of legality for substances affected your work? I'm, curi I'm curious if trying to increase the crackdown on illegal dispensaries could have potentially impacted increased or increased criminal, criminal justice involvement for people in the community. 
That's a very good question and something that um, has been, I guess, on top of everyone's mind ever since um, they legal California legalized uh, cannabis, for instance. Um, the on the one hand, it was meant to bring illegal businesses into a regulated framework. <laughs> Unfortunately, what it did was that it made the price of cannabis so high that illegal dispensaries continue to uh, proliferate. And um, law enforcement is doing a much better job because some of that revenue from cannabis does have to go to, um, to law enforcement as well as um, uh, social equity programs. Um, more so from an economic uh, point of view, not, not so much from a health equity point of view, but. Um... Action in policymakers to the advantage of getting service to uh, vulnerable populations. Um, GIS is just a powerful tool to tell these stories from Dana. Uh, uh, and so thank you, great information. Um, the AV map is excellent way of visualization. So I'm just sort of actually reading all this, but I want to make sure that I also get to the questions here. Um, uh, let's see here. I think Gaiden, uh, I'm trying to actually see if these questions is actually relevant to or county? Is that local, state, or federal? So for California, it's state. Um, uh, through the There's license information on through the California Alcoholic Beverage Control. Now for other states, it, I think it depends on um, if it's like a state controlled uh, industry or if it's um, was, I, I'm, I'm losing my uh, words, but like if it's um, where, you know, the state owns. Um, if any municipality, if it grants a permit to say a liquor store owner who wants to open up another um, liquor store, the municipality will approve it and then California ABC will issue the license regardless of whether or not there are um, a number of authorized licenses again like you know you could only have like maybe three licenses in a census tract but as long as the municipality approves the license the Cal um, ABC will will issue it or allows the permit, ABC will issue the license. So um, as far as I know, I mean, I've only looked at the um, California, land, the landscape of alcohol in California, but I do think that if you have like a state alcohol, you know, commission or something, then um, on their website, I think that Oh, I'm. Were you on mute? Sorry, or was uh, oh, did my I'm sorry. audio go? Out? Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. That that's that's just me. Um, so I have another question here from Jennifer. What mapping software are you using? So I use um, ArcGIS at the Esri um, ArcGIS desktop and online. But all of that is to say, now that is a, a paid um, software, but I just want to make it clear that there are lots of other open source free software out there that so um, I, I would you know recommend using it, but also compare and find some open source ones and see if maybe that has a better, you know, um, if, if it's better for your organization. Sure. One other thing, I'm sorry. Also, one other thing is that you may not even necessarily have to have GIS software. There are a lot of indexes out there, data sources that they have their map and you can like, for instance, I'm just gonna use the child opportunity index um, for instance. They have their
on data and create a map that way. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I uh, want to make sure that I'm actually not missing anything. Um, <clears throat> Do you have, okay, uh, from Mary Jane again, Meredith, looking at the social determinants of health and being able to map it and connect it to behavioral health is phenomenal. Do you have a link to this study that you did? Uh, we'd we'll love to look at it and see how it can inspire a study in our state. Sure, I can put it in the chat. All right. And um, I'll also put my... Um, uh, my contact information in there if you have any questions. I, I'm i very passionate about GIS. I love to talk to people about GIS. So, yeah. No, and we appreciate, we appreciate your presentation. This has actually has been great. I've learned quite a bit as well. Uh, that um, Meredith is using. So we put that in the chat as well uh, for those of you who might be interested. Um, and so also we might not have to, to, might not have enough time to answer all the questions. So I just wanted to remind you that questions that we don't answer in the workshop, um, we're going to create a QA and a document with the answers there. Also, I want to remind you to actually register for next week, the uh, post workshop Q and A. We're meeting for an hour, right? And we'll go over, as you register, submit your question. And we want to make sure that we'll have the answers for that uh, one-hour workshop. Uh, Meredith, I want to thank you once again for your time. It was, it was amazing. Dana, thank you so much. You both actually had made my day. I am actually so honored that you actually... Uh, People love this workshop because they actually learn quite a bit when it comes to data visualization, looking actually how you can actually use it in real uh, examples by two wonderful organizations. So um, I'm, this was great. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually just looking at some, uh, some of the comments here. Uh, and so I appreciate it. Appreciate it. So we are close to the end. Um, and so I want to make sure that I don't go without... Uh, mentioning some um, uh, announce, uh, announcements, making some announcements here. So I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, like I said, we're going to be sharing the related resources that are recorded once available at the Anchor website. Remember to sign up for the, the, the limited capacity workshop Q&A session on March 28th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. So you register at the link, submit your, reg uh, your questions as well. Um, and so I want to I wanna thank you. On behalf of the SAMHSA Office of Behavioral Health Equity, we want to acknowledge and thank you for being here. And we look forward to being with you throughout this series. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the day and rest of the week. Bye-bye.